Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. The lazy, yeah, the lazy job seeker. I've had quite a number of lazy, yes, lazy clients. They, they know they should network. They know they should cold contact. But they insist on doing no more than answering a few ads or maybe getting more schooling. Because yeah, as a student, they're on the taking end. They're getting to learn things without having to give much back. Yeah, the term paper, but that's not a whole lot. They And they've got everything nicely structured for them, unlike it, the real world of work where you've got to be producing all the time and it's not so structured. Certainly job seekers, no matter how much structure I give them, it's still it's still all on them. In addition, they like school because, because of grade inflation. They need to do very little to get passing grades. And... Voila, they do that, and they've got a socially acceptable reason to avoid being productive. My sloths, forgive the denigrating term, but I'm feeling a little sarcastic today. Uh, my sloths rationalize their laziness with excuses that are inspired by shrinks. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of imposing, fear of embarrassment. A lot of therapists, not all, of course. A lot of therapists, a lot of counselors, a lot of coaches. They dispense those kind of explanations, I don't know whether it's consciously or unconsciously, to keep their clients liking them. And so, therefore, they're more likely to pay that 100 bucks an hour or more and keep coming back. Those kind of explanations, you know, fear of rejection, fear of imposing, fear of failure, fear of embarrassment, they make clients feel very good because those excuses externalize responsibility. So those slugs, those sloths, don't have to confront their laziness. They don't have to confront that they're unwilling to grow up and accept a measure of uncomfortability as required for being an adult, for making a contribution. But lazy is not a word that's allowable in polite lexicon, let alone to be said by a source of support that you're paying for. But having been a career and personal coach to, would you believe, 5,300 clients now over the past 30 years, I can confidently assert, and I deeply believe, that many people really are just lazy. There is a grand canyon of difference between my successful clients and friends and my unsuccessful ones. Yes, intelligence, that is the ability to solve complex problems, is probably the number one differentiator between my successful and unsuccessful clients and friends, but drive is the number two characteristic. And I believe that so-called supporting lazy people only occasionally helps them move forward. More likely, too, is, to use that phrase that's not popular these days, tough love. So here are some tough love responses to the standard excuses that my lazy clients make for their inaction. I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up. I, and they could be already 40 or 50. I don't want to pick the wrong thing. Fact is, there really is no one right career. After just brief career exploration, a person has much more to lose by waiting for somehow the, the career to descend like manna from heaven or that their further explanation, explorations will yield it than for them simply to pick something and then throw themselves into becoming excellent at it and, yes, adapting that career to suit their strengths. And, of course, it is possible that it was a terrible choice and the adaption doesn't going to work and they got to switch careers. But when day is done, the vast majority of people would be wise to spend little time in career exploration and to pick something and, as I said, throw themselves into becoming excellent at it, adapting the career to suit their strengths. The next excuse that my, my lazy clients use all the time is, I'm afraid of imposing. Well, emailing or phoning a brief, honest query to an employer or to a networking contact imposes no more than when stopping someone on the street for directions. When someone stops you and asks you for directions, unless you're really in a rush, do you feel put upon? Neither does that potential employer or networking contact. Next excuse that my lazy clients make, I'm afraid of embarrassing myself. Fine, so practice on yourself, practice on your friend, and then reach out first to your low priority contacts so you can get the kinks out first before you go to your high priority contacts. Fear of embarrassment does not justify not diligently networking nor cold calling or contacting at least employers by email. And unfortunately that is required, that cold calling and networking with your existing networking, 
is unfortunately required to land a good job unless you're a star who's got an in-demand skill set like for example artificial intelligence software programmer and if you were a star in an in-demand field you probably wouldn't even be watching this video let alone paying a career counselor the employers would be plucking you out of the matting crowd begging you to apply for good jobs next excuse that my uh, lazy clients give is I'm afraid of rejection if you fear that yet more rejection is going to confirm that you're a loser do you need to lower your job target to something that is a little more realistic for now or if your fear of being a loser is irrational okay feel the fear but force yourself to do it anyway you can after a while as every phobia therapist knows you're going to get at least somewhat desensitized, desensitized enough to rejection. Or who knows? You may more quickly than you think get a yes, get that good job, as long as your job target really is appropriate to your ability, your skills, and the job market. And the final uh, excuse that my lazy clients make is I don't want to sell out. My clients who invoke that excuse proclaim they're an artist or a socialist or whatever. And so they need to devote themselves to their art, to their activism, whatever. That's feeble. Unless you're really talented and work hard and probably are well-connected, your visual or performing art is probably not a career. It's a hobby. And regarding your activism, you have two choices. Sure, walk your talk by fighting for that rare, well-paying job, saving the snail darter, dumping Trump or whatever. Or like most people, make your advocacy your avocation. The real reason job seekers are lazy? Now, I'm not talking here about people with severe mental or physical uh, illness. I'm talking here about the garden variety procrastinator. The core reason that they do a desultory job, a desultory, I forgive me, a desultory job search is that they know they're not going to starve. Their parent, their romantic partner, or the taxpayer will prevent that. So they suppress that they're parasites or they fail to recognize that their life's worth is defined by their contribution. They play the aforementioned psychological tricks on themselves, the fear of failure, fear of success, all that stuff, so they can rationalize their quote-unquote need for lazy activities, the need to meditate, the need to be in nature, the need to be a stay-at-home partner, or that that home-cooked meals and the helicopter parenting is really required, when in fact it often hurts the kid more than it helps. My sloths, hedonistic lifestyles, go beyond what they can even rationalize as productive. Atop the hiking and the meditation and all that, they spend a lot of time under the influence, or playing video games, or watching TV, or playing sports, or chatting and chatting with friends, or spending lots of time having sex, or playing on Facebook and Instagram, or shopping on the mall or on the net. They're useless. No, they're worse than useless because some more honorable person gives up their hard-earned money to reward the sloth. Unless the person has a serious mental or physical illness, rarely would a person facing homelessness continue to be so inert. It's only when their brain, if only unconsciously, calculates that their quality of life will be more pleasurable by not working or by minimally working that they become lazy and looking for work. Responsibility be damned. A solution? If you don't suffer from a major mental or physical illness, you have to recognize and not suppress the fact that not becoming self-supporting does make you a parasite on that person that you claim to love or on the taxpayer. Recognize that your life's value depends so heavily on the extent of your contribution. Even if you're a ditch digger, you're making a contribution. But watching Netflix, backpacking, gossiping, or playing golf is not a contribution. If you recognize just those two things, that not being self-supporting makes you a parasite and that your life heavily depends on you being productive, if you recognize just those two things, all the tactics don't matter. The time management schemes, the Pomodoro technique, blah, 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 all that stuff. My successful clients and friends use none of that stuff. They know, without giving it a second thought, that their primary responsibility, hour in and hour out, day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out, is to be productive. I'm Marty Nemco, and thank you for watching.